I went through a period of intense fear in my life that started quite subtly, and only in hindsight did I truly grasp the gravity of the situation. It all began during a routine visit to the grocery store. At that time, I had become somewhat of a recluse, spending the majority of my days at my secluded country house, far removed from the bustle of the town. My infrequent trips to the store were my only opportunities to observe people. One day, I noticed a woman who stood out in the crowd. She appeared to be around 20 years younger than me, dressed in dark attire with jet black hair and multiple facial piercings. Her distinct appearance made her memorable, but what piqued my curiosity was the sense that she kept glancing in my direction. Whenever our eyes met, she would quickly avert her gaze or look down. Initially, I dismissed it, attributing her repeated appearances in my vicinity to mere coincidence in the expansive store. However, over time, I began encountering this enigmatic woman more frequently whenever I ventured into town. While I didn't initially dwell on it, I couldn't help but notice her uncanny presence. She seemed to materialize at the grocery store every time I shopped, and on several occasions, I caught glimpses of her trailing me as I turned corners. Strangely, she never pursued me when I confronted her with a direct look. Then came the unsettling letters. The first one, written in uppercase letters with a pencil, was addressed to me by name. It berated me for supposedly concealing my true identity, insisting that I admit the truth before diary consequences ensued. Initially, I dismissed it as an oddity, preferring to believe it was an isolated incident. Several more letters followed each adopting a progressively ominous tone, while continuing to make veiled threats about revealing my hidden secrets. After receiving a series of these unnerving messages, I began to take them seriously. Fearing for my safety, I reported the situation to the police, although they could do little without a way to trace the letter's source. As the threatening letters persisted, my paranoia intensified. They all carried similar warnings promising dire consequences if I continued to ignore them. The police offered no solace, and my anxiety grew, making me increasingly anxious about encountering the sender in person. Despite my growing paranoia, I still felt secure within the confines of my home. Apart from the unsettling letters, nothing untoward had occurred there. That provided some solace amidst the turmoil. One fateful night, I settled down in my second-floor study, determined to lose myself in a book. However, an unexplainable sense of uneasa pervaded me. It was that feeling when everything seems off kilter and I couldn't quite pinpoint the source. I rose from my chair multiple times, attempting to distract myself with different drinks, but the discomfort persisted. Finally, I glanced to my left, where I was met with a disconcerting sight. Through the darkened window, I discerned movement outside. My secluded abode lacked streetlights, but it was apparent that someone was lurking among the trees. My heart leaped as I identified the figure. It was the same woman I had spotted weeks earlier. She had positioned herself in a tree, affording her a direct view into my window. Panicked, I reached for my phone to call the police. However, when I returned my gaze to the window, she had vanished. Hastily, I descended the stairs and ensured all my doors were securely locked. I activated the outdoor lights and scanned the surroundings, but the woman had disappeared without a trace. When the police arrived, their search yielded no results. I filed another report and provided a description of the woman, whom I knew nothing about other than her unsettling appearances. In the days that followed, nothing significant occurred, but the absence of events was unnerving in itself. Fear and paranoia continued to plague me, with uncertainty as my constant companion. Eventually something did happen, though not in the form of another letter. A small package appeared on my porch, addressed to me. I had no expectations of receiving a package, and it didn't immediately connect to the letters or the woman. However, upon opening it, I was confronted with a chilling message. A dead crow lay within. The choice of this particular bird, which I held an affinity for and had displayed images of in my home, 
only heightened my distress. Helplessly, I filed yet another police report. Lacking any substantial leads or information, I found myself trapped in a relentless cycle of fear and uncertainty. So, how does this story conclude? The truth may be anticlimactic. I received no more letters after the gruesome package, and the woman in the tree never resurfaced. I never encountered her on the streets again, and the threat seemingly dissipated. Yet even today I remain haunted by the lingering fear that a sinister presence might still be watching me from the shadows. The most peculiar individual I ever crossed paths with in my life goes by the name of Alan. Oddly enough, I consider this a compliment, given my own inclination towards the unusual. However, my acquaintance with Alan wasn't just strange, it eventually took a dangerous turn. My childhood was marked by constant relocation, not due to any exciting reason like being in a military family, but rather because of my father's struggles with alcoholism. He somehow managed to secure disability benefits through a doctor's deception, and our nomadic existence ensued. This meant I frequently found myself in new neighborhoods and schools, making it challenging to form lasting friendships. Eventually, I stopped trying to connect with others, especially as I watched those relationships disintegrate time and again. This withdrawal from social circles led me to immerse myself in academic pursuits, particularly a deep love for books. My encounter with Alan occurred when I was 14 years old, during yet another move to a new school. This particular school, though, remains somewhat of a blur in my memory. My family settled into a sizable house that left me puzzled as to how we could afford it. Perhaps it was because it was located in the middle of nowhere, where housing costs might have been more reasonable. The usual cycle repeated itself as I struggled to fit in at the new school. I didn't face outright bullying, but rather a gradual drifting into the shadows as one of the quiet, solitary kids who preferred their own company. It was within this isolation that I came across Alan, another kindred spirit of solitude. Alan and I shared many common interests, with a few distinct differences. While I was dedicated to excelling in school, he couldn't care less about academic achievement. Despite his evident intelligence and ability to acquire knowledge independently, he showed no interest in performing well in school. He was the type who aced tests but never bothered with homework assignments. Our shared passion, though, was astronomy, a connection that would prove pivotal in our story. Both of us lived in remote areas, but Alan insisted that his home provided an even better vantage point for stargazing than mine, despite having never visited my place. This enthusiasm for astronomy would soon play a crucial role in our shared adventure. We eagerly anticipated a meteor storm scheduled to grace the night sky one fall evening. Alan, as usual, insisted that his location would offer the optimal view. So, I agreed to travel to his house after school on a Friday via bus. While the meteor shower was set for Saturday night, we hoped to catch some early activity on Friday evening. Alan didn't exaggerate about the remote location of his home. It was situated deeper into the countryside than my own. I was accustomed to having a few neighbors nearby, but his house stood alone on a hill, with no other dwellings in sight. The yard was clear of obstructive trees, making it an ideal spot for stargazing. I couldn't help but marvel at the beautiful house. The first night passed without incident, and Alan appeared entirely unremarkable. We enjoyed the evening, even catching a few meteors, although they were scarce. Alan suggested we take to the roof during the main meteor shower for an even better view. I hesitated, given my slight fear of heights, but the allure of the spectacle convinced me to give it a try. The following night found us on the rooftop with snacks in tow, while Alan's parents were away for the evening. We set up his telescope, just in case, although we planned to enjoy the meteor shower without it. It was a unique vantage point for an unforgettable celestial show. I had nearly forgotten my fear of heights while perched on that rooftop, captivated by the meteor shower. However, at one point, Alan suggested we use the telescope to observe Saturn, with its prominent rings visible that night. It was an experience I'd never had before, and I agreed, 
gingerly standing up on the slanted roof. That's when it happened. Before I could regain my balance, Alan's hands pushed me with force. I plummeted from the roof, rolling and crashing onto the ground below. I had broken several bones, as I would later learn, rendering me unable to move. What followed was even more bewildering. Alan, instead of rushing to my aid, simply stood on the roof, watching the meteor shower as I lay in agony below. I endured hours of pain, repeatedly calling out for help, clinging to the hope that Alan would realize his terrible mistake and come to my rescue. But he never did. Finally, it was Alan's parents who returned home and found me. They did what they could to get me to the hospital. Meanwhile, they discovered Alan, still perched on the roof, seemingly unfazed by the dire situation unfolding beneath him. In the aftermath, I learned that Alan had a dark history, shrouded in rumors of violent altercations with other kids and bizarre incidents. Many students and even teachers had steered clear of him, and it appeared that his erratic behavior was well documented. I couldn't help but wonder if I might have been forewarned about Alan had I not been so withdrawn and antisocial when I first arrived at that school. Perhaps someone could have shared the unsettling truth about him, sparing me the painful lesson I learned firsthand. The day's weather forecast had predicted a looming storm that seemed poised to unleash its fury, and it only promised to worsen as evening descended. I held a job with a roughly second shift schedule, a routine that I still maintain to this day. However, my job also entailed a lengthy commute back home, one that I dreaded especially when the weather turned treacherous. The drive itself didn't bother me under normal circumstances, but the prospect of navigating a severe storm left me feeling apprehensive. Throughout the day, the skies rumbled with thunder and cracked with lightning. It felt as if the storm had been building for hours, intensifying with each passing moment. By the time I was preparing to leave work, it seemed as though this peculiar meteorological phenomenon was locked in an unrelenting holding pattern. My shift ended at 11 p.m., signaling the beginning of a journey that would take over an hour to reach my home. Given the ominous storm brewing outside, I braced myself for a significantly longer commute than usual. My route home primarily involved navigating winding back roads, some of which traversed mountainous terrain. The nature of my job often required such lengthy drives to remote locations, and I had grown accustomed to these long hauls. That night, however, with the ferocious winds violently shaking my small pickup truck, I knew I had to exercise extreme caution, which would inevitably stretch the journey even further. The roads, typically desolate during my late-night drives, appeared even emptier than usual. I recall not encountering a single car or truck for the majority of the ride. Considering the countless times I had embarked on this drive, I couldn't explain why I committed the mistake that I did. Perhaps it was the size of my truck, or perhaps my attention was fixated on maintaining control amid the howling gales but I inexplicably veered onto the wrong road. It was a road strikingly similar to the one I usually took, which made my error all the more confounding. In my state of mind, I continued down the unfamiliar path, oblivious to my misdirection. Eventually, I realized my mistake, but by then, I wasn't particularly alarmed. It was just a matter of retracing my steps and getting back on track, I thought. The worst-case scenario would be that it added around 40 minutes to my journey. With no work obligations the next day, the time difference didn't trouble me much. My primary concern remained the adverse weather conditions that continued to challenge my drive. After correcting my course, I endured a grueling drive, battling the relentless storm as I aimed to reach home. Upon arrival, I was met with an eerie sight. The house was shrouded in darkness, suggesting that my roommate was out. My assumption couldn't have been more mistaken. As I stepped inside, I was confronted with the grim reality that my roommate had been brutally assaulted, nearly beaten to death. In a frantic rush, I managed to get him to the hospital in the nick of time, saving his life, although it was a close call. 
He confided in me about the horrifying ordeal. It turned out he had been involved in the drug trade and had become embroiled in a dangerous dispute with his supplier. This altercation had led to the near-fatal beating he endured. The chilling part of the story was that the attack had occurred approximately half an hour before I arrived home and discovered him. The realization sent shivers down my spine as it struck me that had I not taken that wrong turn costing me an extra 40 minutes on the road, I might have returned home just in time to witness the drug deal gone awry and potentially suffered the same gruesome fate. It was a chilling reminder of how random choices and unforeseen circumstances can drastically alter the course of one's life.